Good morning, all, and welcome to member of Knesset Yair Lapid. I should say, welcome back to the Brookings stage, although this time it's a virtual stage, of course. A very mm -hmm. brief introduction, Yair Lapid is chairman of the centrist Yeshatit party, and he's the leader of the opposition in the Israeli Knesset, previously minister of finance and a member of the security cabinet. Israel has had no less than three national elections in the past two years, and I do not envy him and his staff. They are facing a fourth on March 23rd. It's really deep and unprecedented territory. Um, past three elections, uh, you ran as part of the Blue and White Coalition. Now you had your own party again, Yesh Atid, currently polling as the second largest in the Knesset behind Prime Minister Netanyahu. So besides a welcome, if I may, I'm gonna jump already straight into questions and ask you, can you tell us, not in terms of domestic politics where there, and policy, where there's a lot of difference between you, in terms of foreign policy, could you tell us a little bit what is the difference between you and Prime Minister Netanyahu in practical terms? Uh, okay. First of all, hi, Nathan. Good to be here. Um, well, here, well, few issues, I guess. I mean, there are things we agree upon, like uh, uh, how to deal or, or the general approach uh, towards uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, which we'll probably get into pretty soon. Uh, I would say the basic differences would go, A, on the Palestinian issue, in which I believe we need to move forward on uh, the two-state solution. We need to go through a regional conference, but the end goal should be two states. Um, I would say Prime Minister Netanyahu has been playing with the idea, uh, but looking back at his 15 years in office, obviously he's not going to do anything. So, I mean, by now we know that because he didn't do anything uh, so, so far, thus far. And uh, the kind of coalition he can have will prevent him from, from moving forward. Uh, I believe this is, this is crucial to the future of Israel that will move forward on the Palestinian issue. I, I, here's, here's where I differ from the Israeli right and from the Israeli left. Um, I differ for the, from the Israeli right in my determination to try and, and have uh, those two states, one next to another, a very strong Israel next to a demilitarized uh, Palestinian state. I differ from the Israeli left because I, I do not believe, unfortunately, that this will be the end of conflict. Uh, I mean, the big, the big mantra of the Israeli left will always is always uh, the end of conflict. I think in, in my lifetime, unfortunately, there will be no end of conflict, but we can have uh, a self-recognized and, and global recognized Palestinian state next to Israel that has a conflict with Israel on two major issues. One is uh, Jerusalem, because we will not agree uh, to uh, divide Jerusalem, and the other is the right of return, which is which is unacceptable to us because it's the end of of the Jewish majority uh, of in Israel, and therefore the end of the Jewish state. So these two issues will be uh, um, an ongoing conflict between the two states, but it will be a conflict between two countries, and there are countries in the world that has conflicts with uh, uh, between them. And will be two more countries like this, but this will be a more uh, 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 dignifying uh, uh, kind of, of of conflict because it will be between two peoples uh, that has uh, recognized each other. The other issue I differ from Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I've been criticizing him about this quite a bit. Is uh, I think I'm going to do a much better work in. Uh, uh, making sure Israel goes back, not staying, but goes back to be a bipartisan issue in the United States. I mean, uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has made the mistake of affiliating himself way too much with the Republican Party, starting uh, with this conflict uh, with President Obama and the administration in 2015, which, which escalated to his speech in Congress, if you, if you remember, you probably remember. And... Um, and then, and then, in ways, becoming some sort of a branch um, uh, uh, of the of of you know what? No, it's not even the Republican Party. It's it's a certain part of the Republican Party. I don't think it's it's the place of an Israeli Prime Minister. For example, just the other day, 
uh, uh, singing the obituary of, of Rush Limbo. This is, this is not uh, uh, the kind of politics we should have. Uh, what we need, and so we need to go back to create, uh, uh, to make Israel, to making Israel uh, acceptable for both sides of the alley, for, for the Democrats and Republicans as well. So, and, and, be, on, and on, on the side of this, I will add a third uh, uh, but and quite similar one, uh, uh, a subject which is, which is renewing and, and, and um, uh, making sure we have better relations with the, the uh, EU, with the Europeans, with uh, the UN, with, with international, established, international establishments. I think this, this needs to be changed. So this is generally the differences between us. Thank you. I'd like to unpack that a little bit, if I may. And as you'll be shocked to hear, I'd like to start with Iran. Um, yeah. You implicitly criticized a statement by the Israeli chief of staff recently at the INSS conference, where he seemed to give very strident advice to the United States as to, as to what the United States should or should not do. But on substance, I wonder if you actually disagree with what he said. He criticized the JCPOA as a bad deal. He urged the United States not to return to the JCPOA quickly or at all. Um, mm -hmm. On the actual substance, is there really much daylight between you and Chief Staff Kochavi or Prime Minister Netanyahu on the Iran issue? Well, first of all, I mean, not really, but I'm not wearing any uniforms. Uh, and therefore, I mean, I'm allowed to say things that I think he shouldn't have. Um, but here's the thing. There are three basic possibilities. The best of all will be the right agreement. I think, I mean, uh, an improved agreement, which includes uh, uh, the ballistic missiles pro program, which includes uh, a much better supervision. I don't know, you probably heard that the Iranians has, has uh, uh, unilaterally declared that they're now getting rid of another chunk of, of supervision um, uh, uh, coming from, from abroad. Uh, so there's, I mean, a different sunset clause. Uh, um, there should be, a part of this should be, uh, should deal with the, the renewed or improved agreement should be, uh, uh, should, ha should include some, some kind of an answer uh, to Iran's, Iran's involvement in, in international terror. All these are, are not in the JCPOA. So this is the best option. Um, even if you want to move back or, or, or start by moving back uh, uh, to the JCPOA, you should have at least a decision uh, made about where you want to go to uh, next. This is what President Macron was trying to tell the world and the, and the, the Americans. Uh, the best, second best, is no agreement but uh, sanctions. Uh, uh, I want to remind you again what you know, that the uh, Iranians has agreed to the JCPOA because the Obama administration has tightened the sanctions like no one ever did before. And therefore, this is the right uh, way to go about it. Uh, appeasement was never a good idea with the Iranians because they are the best negotiators maybe in the world. And the third and worse option is a bad agreement. And I think the JCPOA was not a, a good enough agreement. I think going back, I mean, tie, tying uh, your first and second question, part of the problems that were created or part of the obstacles that were created after the Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, um, uh, speech at Congress in 2015 is that we were not even near the table when decis where decisions were made because the anger and the resentment, justified or not, justified, uh, um, uh, prevented uh, us from being there. So, you know, even uh, the kind of intelligence only Israel have was not uh, 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 on the table while discussing the details of the JCPOA. So I think the, the, the uh, first goal right now is for us to be uh, around discussing it with the administration, showing them what we have and what we think uh, for two reasons. A, because I think we're doing, I mean, we are, we are professionals on this and B, because we have to remember 
Uh, this is not an academic issue for Israel. I mean, it's an existential threat. If the Iranians will have the Islamic bomb, they will be, and they will use it. There's only one address it's going, and this is my house in Tel Aviv or my office in Jerusalem. It doesn't matter, by the way, because it's a big enough uh, uh, explosion uh, to destroy them both. As you know, Israel is a very small country. So uh, uh, we need to be there for this, and we need to have the right relations or create or build the right re relations. I have a lot of expect good. I have high expectations from this administration. I think people like uh, uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, Rob Mali, whom I know from uh, 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 the Obama administration, are the kind of people you want to and you must be able to discuss issues with. So hopefully this is the way we're going to go about it. Thank you. So you described three possibilities, the possibility of a good deal, the possibility of no deal, essentially a continuation of the maximum pressure campaign, more or less, probably with some Biden uh, changes, and then the possibility of a return to what you consider a bad deal. So I'd like to pause for a moment on the middle ground, which is quite possible that there's no new deal achieved. Do you see maximum pressure as successful? Iran today, by some measures, is closer to, uh, to a bomb in theory. However, it's also curtailed in terms of very stringent sanctions on its population and its regime. If we continue in this mode, are you relatively calm? Do you think urgency, the United States should feel a sense of urgency or is maximum pressure more or less succeeding? Well, listen, none of the options we're discussing are, are, are great. And uh, the reason is because we have uh, a regional, it's not a regional superpower, but it certainly is a regional power. Your, Iran is a soft, sophisticated uh, uh, country, great uh, science that is pushing uh, forward a nuclear program uh, uh, for military use because of very deep religious and very dangerous sentiments. So therefore, we're not discussing good options to begin with. We're just discussing how to try and limit and prevent a terrible thing from happening. Because here's one thing we should all agree upon. The world, especially in Israel, but the world or the, the, the entire international community cannot afford a nuclear Iran. And this, and, and uh, uh, we need to do everything in our power to prevent this to, to uh, uh, becomes a military uh, uh, conflict, but it might. And military option is on the table because, again, we cannot afford a, a nuclear Iran. And therefore, what we're dealing with is just ways and measures to prevent something horrible from happening. No good is going to come out of this, no, no matter what. But, but from the lesser goods, the sanctions are uh, a pretty, I mean, learning from our past is are a pretty uh, efficient uh, tool, uh, at least to delay or to make them reconsider or to bring them back, back to the table uh, in the right mode. We don't have much time. Uh, we, we're going to have uh, an election in Iran in June. It, it's, also, it's also a factor. The, uh, some will tell you that uh, um, a renewed JCPOA is a way to support the moderates in this election. Some will tell you history, the history of Iran tells you it, it, it doesn't matter because they're going to vote like anybody else on domestic issues, mostly the, the economy. And besides, uh, um, the supreme leader, Khamenei, is not to be elected. He's there for life. Uh, so therefore, yes, the sanctions are not a great tool, it's not, I mean, the situation is not great, but it's a tool and should be considered uh, uh, as one. So thank you, in the interest of time, and our time is very short, so I, I will turn to the Palestinian issue. We, a lot of the questions we received online, you'll be surprised to hear were about that, you will not be surprised to hear were about that. And you described a difference between you and Prime Minister Netanyahu on support for the two-state solution. Although your version of the two-state solution is quite different from that the Palestinians or even many American administrations have spoken about, in particular on the issue of Jerusalem. I wonder if you could describe a little bit what practically could be done in the near term. As you know better than I, most Israelis are extremely skeptical of a deal with the Palestinians that it could be possible, and Palestinians are extremely skeptical that it one is as well. 
Can you tell us a little bit what can be done in the short term if you become prime minister after March? What, what do you think can be done now? Well, I've been pushing since 2015 the idea of a regional conference, which will be the beginning of a negotiation. Now, actually, the conditions have improved because of the Abraham Accords, because of the kind of agreements we have now with, with the Gulf countries, with the Emirates, with UAE and others, and because of the kind of relationship that is being cautiously built with, with other Gulf countries. So uh, uh, the atmosphere towards such a, a conference is, is even better than it was when I started discussing this. The problem is the world and, and, and the new administration is, is, is uh, being as positive as, as it, it looks it's going to be is maybe the right uh, uh, voice to, to, to uh, pronounce this, must tell the Palestinians that this is not a zero-sum game. It is not either we get whatever we want, we have ever asked for, or we are not playing ball. It is a negotiation, and therefore there should be some pushing and shoving. And uh, uh, it, 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 I mean, we will not get whatever, everything we want. They will not get whatever they want. The Palestinians has announced... Uh, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, um, uh, President Abbas was elected for four years, and this was in 2005. So th this is not a real democracy, uh, the way we understand a democracy. Well, they, they may be facing elections very soon this year. And now they're saying we're talking about the election. There's already talks about the cancellation of the coming election uh, for several reasons. But what we need is, uh, uh, I mean, if I'm prime minister, then you have in Israel that is willing to play ball, that is willing to discuss, that is open to suggestions and wants to come to the table with no preconditions. Uh, what we need is Palestinians who understand this is, I mean, you know what, even the word as they knew it is gone. It's not like uh, 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 the Arab world is now conditioning any uh, uh, signing peace deals with Israel uh, on the Palestinian issue. No, this is not the way it is anymore. We should use this instead. I mean, in a way, the, the Palestinians can tell themselves, yes, we are angry at the uh, Muhammad bin Ziyad for agreeing to have a deal with Israel, but Israel can, must understand that now you tend to listen better to your friends than to your foes. And now that we can create some sort of an atmosphere that is pro-agreement, and use this new accords as a, as a tool to promote a cautious beginning at, through a regional conference uh, discussing things. We all know the basic uh, uh, outline. I mean, I mean the, the big blocks, it's the uh, Bush letter to Sharon, it's the Clinton parameters. Yes, and, the, and I'm telling you in advance, there will be no real successful compromise on Jerusalem and there will be no successful compromise on the right of return and therefore we should declare those issues as unsolved and then we're going, we need to discuss the possibility of be, these being unsolved issues between two sovereign countries. One issue that comes up a lot and we've received questions on that as well is the situation in Gaza of course. Uh, very recently, with Israeli support, a deal has been reached to uh, greatly enhance the energy supply in the Gaza Strip. But as you know, about 2 million people there live in terrible conditions. Is uh, two, two questions really here. Would you try to fundamentally change the situation in Gaza one way or another? We've heard all sorts of suggestions in Israel. One way or another, would you try to fundamentally change it? And secondly, do you think it is in interest, Israel's long-term interest that Gaza and the West Bank be separate, as some have suggested in government, or in the long term, do you hope to see one Palestinian government in the Palestinian areas in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip? Let me start by just saying what is usually ne neglected in this kind of conversation. What is happening in Gaza is heartbreaking. These, uh, these are, I mean, these are children. I mean, it's, it's, Gaza is young. I mean, demographically, these are children that feels they have no future. This is unemployment. This is hunger sometimes. Now you can say, and, and we have all said that it's their fault. I mean, nobody forced them to choose and to elect. They elected Hamas, a terrible 
violent Islamic fundamentalist terror organization uh, uh, to lead them to a, 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 a terrible uh, uh, nothing. And yet, I mean, even if people make mistakes and nations make mistakes, uh, when the suffering is suffering, and my heart goes to every child in Gaza uh, uh, who's, who's afraid of the COVID-19, who, who's his, his people are dying around him. And we need to improve that. And we need, because, I mean, because uh, of humanitarian reasons, uh, we need to, to make sure Israel's security is not breached. We remember the terror tunnels. We re, I mean, we, we do remember uh, uh, that since the disengagement, since we've left Gaza, more than 15,000 uh, missiles were fired upon, missiles and rockets were fired upon Israeli citizens. So, of course, security is the number one in every country, the number one issue, the security of our people. Uh, but if doable, we have to try to improve the life of the people in Gaza in spite of the kind of regime that is running their lives. Having said that, I, I do believe uh, it is in the best interest of Israel, it's in the best interest of the Palestinians, that there will be one leadership for the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, and it should be uh, not Hamas, uh, uh, not uh, 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 terror organization, but the PA uh, as it was before 2005. Um, I hope they've learned that uh, this this kind of I mean, terror organizations are never uh, um, uh, good leaders for for nations, uh, and therefore I hope the Palestinians understand this that this is a bad idea. This was a terrible idea to elect Hamas into power, and if if it's in my hand and there are possibility, of, I mean again, Israel's security first, the security of our people, the security of the people of the Israeli. Uh, I wanted to say the Israeli south, but the, the last conflict we had, the missiles and rockets uh, uh, reached my home in Tel Aviv as well. So it's the entire uh, country. Uh, uh, as long as we are safe, we should do everything in our power to make sure children in Gaza has some sort of a future, even if they have terrible leadership. A related question before I turn briefly to, to domestic issues as well, uh, to wrap it up. Um, we've received a lot of questions, and of course, you, you may have seen there's quite a bit of discussion in the United States uh, these days, and especially this week, around the disparity in vaccination between Israel, which is a world leader in vaccination, and Palestinians in the territories, including in Area C under full Israeli control. Um, a question we receive is quite simple. Would you support Israel making far more effort to vaccinate Palestinians under its rule or Palestinians in the Palestinian Authority? Uh, isn't it Israel's responsibility, given that it controls, in, to a large degree, uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip? This is the question we received. Well, first of all, in terms of, of responsibility, the Oslo Accords were very clear that uh, every health issue is, uh, 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 the, is, should be arranged and, uh, by the Palestinian Authority, not by Israel. I mean, the, the, uh, it's, part, it's part of the constituency, it's part of the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority to deal with health issues. But they are Area free. C, they don't rule Area C at all. Yeah, so I know. But no, no, I'm saying I'm talking about the entire PA now. They are free to negotiate a similar or a different deal with uh, uh, Pfizer or Moderna or, or, or Sputnik. I don't, I don't, I'm, sure, I don't, I'm not sure. I think Sputnik is the name of the Russian uh, vaccine. Uh, and we, of course, uh, 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 will, will not deny them of, of anything. Having said that, uh, I mean, after vac finishing uh, the vaccination of the people of Israel, I see no reason for Israel not to be helpful uh, in any way it can uh, to vaccinate the Palestinians for two reasons. One is, of course, humanitarian. I mean, we don't want people, innocent people to die. And B, they are, they are so close to us. Uh, if we will be vaccinated and they will not, sooner or later, it will kind of, of flow into Israel. So it's uh, in our best interest and it's also uh, within our values that people are people, suffering is suffering. And if you can prevent suffering, it's the moral thing to do. So I'd like to end with a very easy question and we don't have much time, so it'll be perfect. What's this election about? This fourth election? You probably don't remember. I think it's the fourth. It may be the fifth or the sixth, but I believe it's the fourth. Um, what is this about? It's not about the issues we discussed today, is it? No. No, it's about what you've just mentioned. 
it's about government. It's about the system. It's, I, I'm running with, I mean, no one is going to vote for me or for Netanyahu on this, on this uh, conversation. So I'm not, I'm not uh, campaigning here. I'm just telling you, I'm running on the slogan that says, a sane government. Because sanity has become an issue. I don't want to say anything about American politics. I would, I would say only about Israeli politics. But it's a global problem. Uh, I mean, the, we have right now, as you said, it's the fourth election within less than two years. It's, we have a prime minister with three criminal indictments. We have uh, uh, right now uh, uh, all kind of terror supporters moving into the scene. We have a real threat for democracy and we have this ridiculous uh, 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 36 go uh, ministers government that can do nothing. And therefore, even though we succeeded with the vaccination, there are thousands of th and thousands of people who are dying not only from COVID-19, but from the mess this government has caused. So this is a, this is what it's about. It's about sanity, dignity. We are running a, a, a campaign that says uh, the system is broken. Why not? Well, it's time for us to fix it. So even though me and uh, President Biden are very, very, very different people, we are actually saying the same thing to our people. Leader of the Opposition, uh, Yair Lapid, thank you very much for joining us again. We look forward to hearing you from, from you in the future. And uh, please thank stay you. sane. We hope everyone in the campaign stays sane. And I should thank say, you. just as a matter of, uh, of uh, fairness, uh, we look forward also to hosting Prime Minister Netanyahu when schedule permits, so he can also make uh, his argument, of course. Thank you very much again, and have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.